Um, um, these are three um, significant sort of art history, coffee table, coffee table sort of books from the early 20th century to the early 21st century. Yeah. This is Duchamp's fountain, where it's the first ready-made, where he just took an object uh, from a store shelf and signed the name to it to sell his art, to sort of challenge what people think about art and whether it's more about the ideas or more about the craftsmanship. And so throughout this exhibition, there there's some works like that, like over here at the my slave knee pads, which mm -hmm. I, uh, which aside from their pretty craftsmanship, they really just came off the shelf. In a, uh, <laughs> the, in, but they in make a statement. Store. Exactly. But um, Damien Hirst's work is really all about death. I mean, he has like rotting sheep and, and, and sharks in, in, um, in formaldehyde and that type of thing in his work. In some ways, I, I really appreciate Hirst in, 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 su in suggesting um, that art can serve a very different function than a mere like sort of pretty decorative objects and, and that it can really challenge uh, people's thinking about different sorts of profound ideas. But another thing, since I began learning more about the eugenics and that type of thing, I realized that all the death imagery is maybe even more disturbing to me. But in other instances, that sort of cool factor about death is kind of disturbing to me. And it's funny that now it's been ramping up over the last couple of years. So now um, you look at the little girl's section of the store and you see all sorts of pink, either either camouflage or little skulls all over their clothes. and, and um, and so although there's a lot of death imagery in my work, the little stalls carved in the wooden frames and that type of thing, my message is it's the, the exact opposite intent, how death isn't cool. And it's how to be aware of how those images are out there and how to not be um, drawn into them because, of their, because they have that, some of that factor of... Or numbed by them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Death exactly. culture. That's so interesting. I didn't even think that because... I was actually thinking at the time, I'm like, oh, I'm covering all these heavy issues with the work, and I need something that's a little lighter, maybe a god that touches closer to home, where, you know, I'm interested in culture. This is Robert's <laughs> idea of light and fluffy. <laughs> yeah. This work, to me, has a little bit of an interesting history, because about a decade ago, I carved a 10-foot-tall marble angel for a senator, John Edwards, and his wife, Elizabeth. And so I cast this work, it's plaster, I cast it for my sister, actually. And it was all pretty shiny white plaster at the time. I left it outside, um, thinking that eventually <laughs> it would develop into something, and, and it has. There's a mirror image of this out there in the world that, that's commissioned and created and protected by, um, by people who aren't so disadvantaged. But this is more like the representation of the sort of people who are disadvantaged and, and, and um, not really shown in, is so much, I think, in the textbooks and, and in the media. And so I guess I think of the whole thing, as far as the religious goes, I think of the whole, this is kind of like a, a reliquary of, um, for a half-life, you might say. And you call this one the angel of depleted uranium. Yes. It might help people to understand what it's like to live in a war zone where radioactive waste is spewed by munitions in aerosol form that will be in the environment for four and a half billion years. Well, the depleted uranium yeah. is, um, is in this, this lead container. And I'm, I'm really sort of pleased with Duke that they were, they you keep it they were willing to have it here. It, it's actually a very tiny amount. An American citizen is allowed to own 15 pounds of depleted uranium, which is literally a nuclear waste um, created by the government, left over. But now the um, government gives depleted uranium free to munitions manufacturers because it turns out it's an efficacious substitute for lead. It weighs two-thirds more, and it has a special property, whereas lead is a soft metal. When it hits something, it kind of splatters, but when the depleted uranium hits something, it aerosolizes, and like 60% of it can be lost in that aerosolized form. And there are peer-reviewed studies that show it can travel 26 miles. And oh, this and is the god of secret torture. Yeah. Yeah, the God of Secret Torture, because if you sculpture. Google it or pay attention to um, popular culture, you can see that there are so many arguments that are put forth by um, Harvard professors and by the media and by Hollywood about how useful torture is, how efficacious it is, and how if you love your children, you should really love the idea of torturing people. So even though um, the U.S. assisted in the prosecution of people at Nuremberg for, um, for crimes like that, um, we're just told about what a good thing it is for, 
keeping everyone safe and happy. So, well, this is on that subject. Uh, my first um, big stone commission was sort of interesting. I was 21 years old, and at the time I would sandblast design, sort of two-dimensional kind of reliefs, and that's how, that's how tombstones or monuments are made. And, um, and I was sandblasting in stone, and so I, would, I, w I was talking to some architects, and I said, oh yeah, I'm a stone sculptor, but this was me being the marketer, really. I was just doing this little <laughs> kind of engraving. But, and so um, an, an architect showed me uh, some blueprints that included like four tractor trailer loads of renaissance looking carved stone entranceway and that type of thing and they said well could you do things like that and i said sure of course i could <laughs> and so they said go home and try well, to get the chisel out and figure could, out <laughs> could you could you like show us an example of something like that said, sure and i really didn't even know what tools people used or anything i mean i understood <laughs> that that there were probably chisels involved or other kind of yeah. tools and so um i said well I'm busy for a couple of days. Uh, I'll come back on you know Thursday with um, with an example. And so I, I went home. It's like before the internet, and uh, I went to the library and I, I looked in uh, Thomas Register, which is a big, wide set of volumes about about um, where to find different kind of architectural materials. And so I found that um, like 600 miles away, there was a um, company that that sold fancy limestone moldings and things to courthouses or whatever. And so I went up to their um, scrap pile and I got this big hunk of molding. It was like about six inches by eight inches by a few feet long. And, and I didn't want to just present it as my own because that wasn't really accurate. So, so I, I sandblasted a little series of squares going down one of the planes on the molding. And so I um, went back to the architect and said, well, you know, I found this at my studio, which after I made the little rectangles on the squares on it, I had. And, and you did um, find it. You well, put it yeah. there and you're like, oh, look. It's yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> And they said, okay, and probably because they couldn't find anyone else to do the work. And so um, I said, you know, it'd be a year for me to, or it seemed like a long time, but of course it took me two years <laughs> to figure it out and carve it. But I just started with the easy things and eventually figured out how to do the more complicated things. This, um, the bark was actually peeled by lightning. That's oh, kind of wow. groovy. I know, I chopped down the oak tree myself. Well, sacrifice is a kind of funny word. There's sort of a good sacrifice and a bad sacrifice. I mean, one could um, have different types of sacrifice to help teach their children and, and um, to um, support people that they respect and things they respect. And then there's the sort of bad sacrifice where you don't own yourself and other people assert ownership over you. And this work is really about that type of sacrifice. There's an arrow. <laughs> so this is the demon of peace. Well, peace being such a scary concept that you know might bring about the end of um, health and happiness. So I, I thought I would have a you know a, a different kind of um, entity to um, mix in with with the uh, gods of state and war. I sort of like something that happened accidentally here. The, the frame after I had gold leafed it, and um, left, and then there was also the white powder is bone dust, and after. Um, I left it outside to dry and it rained and it gave it this nice soft pink look and I just thought it worked really well with, with this particular yeah. soft painting. This is the god of the state. Mm -hmm. this, this robot's actual uh, um, American battlefield robot which they expect to replace more and more field soldiers with. <laughs> it's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just really wanted to, to show you know, the, the all power the all powerful entity that can make us healthier, make us wealthier, um, you know, fix all our fears and bring about a better future and and, and you know, who better to simplify that besides Stalin? Dress up like a sultan in your onion head hat. We are building a religion, we're making a brand. We're the only ones to turn to when your castle's